Um, it is wonderful that CI is here. It's been an unrealized project ever since we started the marathon in 2006 to get CIA to London. And it is absolutely wonderful that he made the journey uh, from Minneapolis to be with us here uh, today. Uh, the legendary artist Sia Amajani emigrated at the age of 21 from Iran to the United States to study in Minneapolis, where he lives and works today. His works are included in the collection of the British Museum, the Guggenheim Museum, the Museum of Modern Art. In 2010, Amajani was awarded Chevalier de l'Ordre des Arts et des Lettres by the French government. His many exhibitions include the Reina Sofia Center in Madrid, uh, the Mamco in Geneva. It's particularly important to mention the Mamco because there has been a very, very important exhibition and the Mamco in Geneva with Christian Berna is also working on a book of uh, the collected writings uh, of uh, Sia. Uh, very importantly so, it's also uh, in 1992 that Julia Payton Johns included Sia Armajani in an exhibition here uh, in spring 92 called Like Nothing Else in Tennessee, where his work was shown uh, uh, alongside Katharina Fritsch, Dan Graham, Ludko Gerdes, Thomas Schütte. And it's actually very interesting to remember this exhibition, Like Nothing Else in Tennessee. It has a lot to do with what in German you would call Modellbildhauerei. It was this idea of models, modeling sculptures, sculpturings of models. And that obviously is incredibly interesting in relation to Thomas Schütte, who uh, was uh, part of this exhibition, Visia, and whose work you can now see in the gallery. Please join me in a very, very warm welcome to Sia Amajani. We are welcome. We are, we are very happy you're here. And uh, we, uh, we suggested that we do this as a conversation about the man, many aspects here uh, of memory in your work. And maybe we should begin with the beginning before you left for the United States, when you still lived in, uh, in Iran. Because you, you told me earlier this morning over breakfast that actually the memory stopped once you emigrated to the United States, which I thought was extraordinary. So I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the beginnings. You were born in Tehran in 1939, and I was kind of wondering what are your memories of the Iran of your youth? Okay. There is a theologian, a German theologian, whose name is Paul Tillich, T-I-L-L-I-C-H. Uh, he once said, that even the past achievement could be oppressive. I didn't realize that until I went to the United States. Uh, in Iran, we didn't have any experience except memories. And from time to time, instances of time and reality to make sure that the rest were memories. Uh, oh, we started life with the past tense. It was never the future nor the present time. It was always something referred to, out of your control, out of your domain. It was something always had happened in the past. That's how you grew up. Uh, there was a, a theater, a movie theater. It was called Theater of Civilization, and this man would go around and buy old movies, movies that they were cut off and put in the wastebasket. And he would bring them all back home and glue them together and paint on them. And then uh, once a month, he had a new movie. Please, please don't take yeah, Sia prefers not for you not to take photographs. That's maybe important that we mention that, that no photographs are thank you. taken. Thank you. Uh, and he put it together and he wove into it a old tragic Islamic story of uh, how Prophet's son and grandchildren were killed. 72, 72 of them against an uh, army of thousands. And he would buy movies of Doris Day, Rock Hudson, all of these movies, and he put them back together. And then with ink, he would add, with ink and pen, he would add what he wanted to. You know, the woman, 
Doris Day had a blue eyes, but her hair was all black, and she had a heavy chador hang uh, around her face. Then he, uh, he was a man uh, uh, who had an old tuxedo, and the tuxedo was so old and so many times washed that it was like a mercury, shiny. And then he had a black necktie and a black eyeglasses. And he was very serious, and he had a big uh, pointer, and he walked across the room and point out to the major part of the movie that he was going to show. He was very, very self-righteous and always right. Uh, the movie was put together, and then uh, people would sit on benches, on crates, on boxes, whatever was available. All together, there were maybe 30 or 40 people in the theater. Am I wrong? And that was called, you told me this morning because I never heard about the theater. It was called the theater of uh, civilization. civilization. Right, right. Shall I continue? Yeah, we want to okay. know more. Yes. OK. Uh, then uh, he, would sell the, he was selling the tickets himself, and he would sit people himself, and then he'd start. At the very beginning, he would say, this is a very serious, macabre story. Don't hesitate to cry. And, but please pay attention. And I do not like to repeat repeated questions. Once you ask, it's enough. Then they saw the movie. Uh, the movie was, if you were familiar with the Western movies, they were all Western movies, but with different images, with different stories all the time. And uh, the movie would last about half an hour to 45 minutes, and then that was when he would draw moral and ethical questions, and it was always a question of right and wrong, and right always was right. And then at the very end, he would ask people if they had any questions. And that's when the debate would start. Because somebody would say, I recognize the Rock Hudson. And he said, no, this is not Rock Hudson. This is Ali, the Prophet Ali. <laughs> and it was a huge discussion taking place. But he never backed down. This uh, movie which uh, would change once a month. A friend of mine and I would always go there. And that was our education and training in these two cultures that evolved in Iran, the rich culture and the poor culture. And this movie theater was in the old section, the poor section of Tehran. So, all we knew, it was memory and nothing else. From the very first day we came to this universe until the very last day, somebody told the story that he has or she has heard it from someone else. We never came in contact with the present time until I came to the United States. And I went to a, a store to buy a record player. And, uh, she got me record players, and I said, do you have this record? It was a, a, a song by an American song, a singer. And she said, no, I don't remember. And she said, I, I can check with someone. And I, I, I was quite embarrassed. I said, no, that's fine. That's fine. But she went and said, oh, yes, the, this was very popular two years ago. Uh, and she gave it to me. Then I realized this past year is a long time ago, that there was no references at that time. And I, and I became very, very interested in lobotomy. 
uh, and I was investigating to having a robot to me because uh, I was actually paralyzed. I didn't know how to live because everything which was yesterday was a long time ago. America said history, it's history. It means two days ago was history. It was very, very confusing. And that's why it took me a long time to go through college, even though I had already finished university in Tehran. This is wonderful. And we actually had your dear friend, Monia Sharuri Farmanian, the artist from Iran, here at the uh, Mad Marathon uh, two years ago. And Monia spoke a lot about you, uh, you in the most wonderful way. And she said that it would be very important to talk with you also, because she talked about drawing and calligraphy. And talking about these early years in Iran, I was wondering if you could tell us about calligraphy and this sort of whole idea how calligraphy connects to, to memory. Uh, as you know, on the mosques, on the rugs, uh, anywhere there is a room or space for it, there is some writing. And most of the writing on the mosque is uh, Arabic, which 99% of Iranian at the time I was growing up did not know anything about it. But now here, they memorize the Quran backward and forward. Anyhow, so calligraphy was the only art form that everybody had an access to it. So I, like millions of other people, start writing. Things you had memorized. Because history in Iran was the task for you to remember history was task to memorize. Task to remember algebra it was to memorize. Mathematics to memorize. Poetry to memorize. And they really were not that concerned that you understood it or not as long as you could recite it correctly from the very beginning to the end. And always our history started, uh, at, by the time I left Iran, the history was 7,000 years old. Uh, and every year we would start from the first king, and by the end of the semester, we finished that king. The next year started again, because we never got beyond the first king. It was such a long history. And every teacher would add more to it and get more excited about it. So we knew the first king. That's all. So th this calligraphy became an investment in one's memory, investment in one's past, which was an existential being. Uh, you never talked about someone being old or someone belonging to some other times. Everybody was contemporary, but nobody spoke of contemporary. You also mentioned poetry this uh, morning at breakfast, and that's obviously another early source of memory, uh, the sort of Iranian memory. And you particularly also quoted Hafez and Rumi. And I was just wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about memory and connecting that to sort of memory of craft, memory of ceramic. You somehow connected that. OK. Did I? Yeah. Good. <laughs> now, memorizing poetry was very important. It was an essential part of your education, to remember and memorize poetry. Hundreds of thousands of verses by the time you finish high school. And everyone, the history of Iran has written, because most people could not read and write, in terms of poetry. So there was a, a poet whose specialty was history. Another poet was specialty philosophy, theology, all the social sciences. And there was a, this a great poet, Ferdowsi, who was uh, writing the history of Iran in poetry. And that was the best way for educated and uneducated to read and memorize. So our, our, our memories was part of our existence. It was not memory and life. Life was there so you could remember the memories. Everything evolved around memory. And poetry was the easiest, fastest way for you to memorize history and to know your past. 
That is why when, when I came to the United States, it was such a shocking experience because nobody remembered anything of the past, which was beautiful. Nobody. And everybody on the same level. The equality was predominant everywhere because nobody could have put a fast one on you and say, my grandfather was this, because there was no question of my grandfather. It was you and yourself. So it was a very refreshing way of looking at history and life. So everything became a matter of dialectic of the time, the experience of the time, and nothing before or nothing after. Now, you should imagine that. It would be very difficult for you to imagine that, not to have a, any past. But in, and you are, your generation is becoming more and more like Americans, and more and more you're forgetting about the past, which is wonderful. It frees you. It saves you from obligation to anything or anybody. You, you start the morning as though history starts with you. And everything else is a fantastic experience. So for me, that in itself was a great education uh, to live in the first few years in America was amazingly refreshing. You don't have to remember anything. And the less you remember, the greater you were. That is why I became very interested in lobotomy. I studied it very, very carefully. So much so that I was just about to have a lobotomy. <laughs> and I really, honestly, looking forward to it. <laughs> because I felt such a release. You don't have to remember the past. You don't remember your history. You don't remember your parents. You don't remember your country, nothing. How refreshing it would be to get up in the morning and just think of today and nothing else. <laughs> so I, I became very, very close to having a lobotomy. And uh, finally, I went to this doctor. And he said, uh, Sia, you should know something about lobotomy. It's not that easy. Are you sure you're, what, what you're talking about? I said, yes, I just don't want to have memory. He said, it's more than that. You will lose a lot. So letter by letter, he discouraged me from having a lobotomy. <laughs> and got stuck with I am. And luckily so, because actually memory continues to be very present in your work. I looked at these um, wonderful poems by John Ashbury, uh, which he wrote for one of your bridges, the Irene Hickson Whitney Bridge, where John Ashbury said, and now I cannot remember how I would have had it. It's not the conduit, the confluence, but a place. So I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about starting from this memory point about the bridges, which sure. I think they were influenced by Heidegger, no? Right, of course. Uh, Heidegger is a German philosopher who was a father existentialist, and he was very influential on Jean Paul Sartre, Derrida. Uh, and uh, at the beginning, uh, after the war, he was not very famous in America. And toward the 70s and 80s, he became famous. He's a, he's a profound uh, and very interesting philosopher. If you can manage his language, which is like all German language, is compounded and very difficult to follow. But uh, toward the end of his life, he went to Japan. And he became oriented toward Eastern way of philosophy and language. So the last book he wrote which is called Poetry, Language, Text, uh, and Art. The language is very clear and very precise and very understandable. Uh, Heidegger talks about uh, bridges. It, bridge is an actual, uh, Alfred Whitehead would call it an actual entity. It means that if you have something before the bridge, you have something after the bridge, something above the bridge, something below the bridge. The bridge brings all that together into one neighborhood. So as an, as an authentic human being, 
your, the manifestation of life begins at the time that you have been above, below, before and after in one instance, and you make a realization of yourself. So uh, the bridge, I, I, at, uh, in the 60s, existentialism, I don't know whether any of you remember that, uh, was very popular, especially in the States, in Iran, in Europe. Uh, Jean Paul Sartre and Albert Camus especially were known for it. So I, I was taking a course in a seminar in existentialism. And, uh, and uh, this, uh, the professor Thompson was extensively talking about the experience of existentialism. And after that, I, I would sit in my car after the seminar. Because, you know, in Iran, universities are not that didactic, that serious. It's just a place of meeting. You really don't have to go to colleges or anything. There are people who have been in the university for 20, 30 years. That just becomes a profession, way of life. Suppose that you, I'm a student, that's it. So it was very hard for me to sit in a class. So as soon as the class was finished, I would get into my car and I would drive. One night when I was driving, I passed by this old church, this uh, right-wing Christian church, and there was a picture of Jesus standing in very mimicry, and next to him was Pilate, and a group of angry folks outside and saying, kill him, kill him. And Pilate was saying, what shall I do with this man? And the people in the crowd said, kill him, kill him. And then with a big lettering, he says underneath, what would you do? Then it's a very existential question from you. You are, you're driving the car and minding your own business. All of a sudden, somebody asking you, what would you do with Jesus? That's a very heavy question. So I ended up on top of another car. I was not a good driver. <laughs> and this uh, woman got out of the car and said, officer, I didn't even stop. I don't know what happened. So I was on the top of the car, and my car was filled with books. They all fell apart, and the policeman helped me, brought me down. And he said, what happened? I said, listen, this sign. He said, listen, I've heard so many stories. Please tell it to the judge. <laughs> Anyhow, to make a long story short, the judge did not buy it. <laughs> what, was that? what was the question? Yeah, you mentioned, <laughs> you mentioned Whitehead. And actually, oh, yeah, Whitehead, okay. and Whitehead brings us to your current work. Right. It brings us right from the past into the present, because there are these extraordinary tombs you are doing for right. Whitehead, for Emerson. You mentioned Heidegger, Walt Whitman. Can you tell us about these tombs? Because okay. I think it's very interesting here for memory okay. to hear so about I, what you're working on right now. I step back to tell you why I used John Ashbery, because first he was a poet. Secondly, I need some form of decoration to put on my bridges, to have a cadence of the poetry with a cadence of walk. So when you walk the bridge, you can also read the poetry. That, that was my relationship with John Ashbery. But uh, answering Hans's uh, question, in, you know, I'm, uh, I'm 72, 73 years old, something like that. Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, I'm thinking of tomorrow. Uh, and I, so I'm doing a series of tombs of people who have influenced me, poets, philosophers, writers. Uh, Sacco Vanzetti, you know Sacco Vanzetti? There were these two Italian anarchists who went to the United States in early teens, and they were executed in 27. That is your cafe in Frankfurt is dedicated right, to them. Right, right. 
at the museum at the end of the time. Yeah. They, they, they were in nice human beings. They were, I don't know whether they were innocent or not, but they always presented themselves as being innocent. And that's very interesting. So I was always gravitated toward them, and I read everything about them, and people who have written about psychoanalysis. There were these two anarchists, and in the 20s, anarchism was very a strong political and social movement in America. And Sarkon Vanzetti, their demand was very simple. He said, we have read in Italy, the Constitution guarantees us happiness, the Constitution guarantees us education. And he said, we have been here all these years, and I'm selling fish, and Vanzetti fixing uh, shoes. And we don't have any other education. What happened? Who broke these promises? So their, their demand was very basic, because that is how America promised you before you go there. And when nobody is there to deliver it to you, you feel as though you have been gypped, you know? So they became, at, at that time, many people were anarchists. Uh, Irish American were anarchists. Jewish American were anarchists, Italian American anarchists. That was a baptism of the time. You go through that baptism of being an anarchist and become an American. So the activity around uh, anarchists and their, there was a woman called uh, Emma Goldman. She uh, married the king of gypsies. Uh, she was not a very attractive woman, but she was a very, very strong personality. And she's the one who they forced it out of the United States. She became a citizen and everything, but they forced it out. Uh, she became a, a leader of anarchists in America, even though she was much younger than Sakon Vanzati. Now, what else was it? These, and these tombs you're right, making, tombs, it's yeah. a whole theory, Look, no? there, there, I'm making a, I have a list of uh, 24 tombs, and the last one is going to be mine. I'll save that. Uh, the first one I built is, uh, I have built five of them. Actually, I built eight, but destroyed three, I have five. The first one was uh, Sarko Vanzati. The second was Walt Whitman. You know, had American people understood Hegel by reading Walt Whitman, America would have been a different place. Because Walt, Walt Whitman is the first one who dismisses the notion of the future. He's the first one who dismisses the notion of the past. Walt Whitman talks of the present time. So the question of God, heaven, hell, all of those things belong to something else or somebody else. It is out of domain of Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman can tell you about now. Had he understood, had people read Walt Whitman and understood Hegel, they could understand that Hegel was of the same nature, that he left hell and heaven and everything after life. Not that entity was loose, was a very strong entity, but was not out, was outside of our domain. Then uh, this uh, Walt Whitman I did, uh, you know, it's not a biography. It is not a biography of Walt Whitman that you see this, it means that. It is not any relational explanation of one episode to another episode. When you look at the piece, the tomb does not indicate any aspect of Walt Whitman's life, or his likes or dislikes. Anything is about his biology, anthropology, metaphysics, nothing, or religion, nothing. It is, I have put them together and I really don't know how, tell you the truth. I don't know how. Because I'm a sculptor, I 
had to get something together. And uh, I have started this tomb since 2000, right, in the last 12 years. And it was a very, 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 very difficult task for me because the first Walt Whitman I did, you could actually, had you known a little bit about history of America, Civil War, where uh, Walt Whitman was born, what happened, you could read it in my work. And that was very dissatisfying for me. So I dismissed that and I did a new one and the new one doesn't refer to anything. All to itself, and itself is nothing there. I have done a, 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 a Persian poet, his name is Nima, N-E-E-M-A. He, uh, he was uh, imprisoned uh, during the Shah. Everybody else was too, but uh, so. Uh, and he was uh, in his 70s. He was, he's the father of Persian poetry. You know, uh, what, whatever we have in Iran is poetry. And we had poet 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago. And they all, there is a poet that wrote poetry in 2,000 years ago. That you read it today, you understand it completely. Every word, every adjective, every noun, it's there in existence today, like it was 2,000 years ago. And that is so wonderful because it brings us full circle from the beginning of your work in Iran with poetry to your work now. See, right. thank you so very, thank very you. much. Thank, thank you. 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 Thank you